Camellia sinensis, the botanical name for a leafy tree that has captured the imagination and also fostered and confirmed the aspirations of millions of people over the centuries. This is tea. It is reputed that the Chinese are the first to have encountered this fortunate confluence of leaf with freshly boiled water, an infusion yielding a slightly astringent brew that has everything to do with well-being, positive humor, courtly conduct, and mannerly ceremonials. It is consumed daily as a beverage that stimulates the mind and relaxes the body. It is very much a fact of history that the British in the Victorian era had everything to do with the stature of this relatively humble herb assuming the position tea enjoys in the modern day. An accepted drink conveniently accessed the world over and chosen by many as a wonderful means to facilitate social intercourse or as a break from the routine, be it at home or in the workplace. Victoria Regina herself endorsed it at the St. Louis World Fair and Prime Minister Gladstone raved over its ability to perform impressively within the human organism. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle opined seriously regarding the virtues of the enterprise and recognized Ceylon for what it did. Ceylon was where the British discovered the ideal complement in climate and terrain to be able to fully exploit the inherent nature and variety in the plant and then extract from it a range of flavor that panders to any sybaritic sensibility. This fortuitous occurrence may well have been otherwise if the enterprising British planter had succeeded with coffee as they had planned. In the earlier years of the 19th century, the British plantation industry fairly burgeoned in Asia moving well beyond the custom of trading in spices to acquiring a monopoly in new crops and cultivations that extended well beyond the indigenous traditions. Thus was the empire built. Ceylon, as Sri Lanka was then known, and especially its central hill country, was rapidly altered in its state and form, and the country was awash in coffee plantations. Where the local population was insufficient or uncooperative, the colonial government was able to secure indented labor from overseas, and therefore literally thousands of men and women from the arid regions of South India were cajoled by artifice and contrivance and transported lock, stock and barrel to work in clearing the jungles in Ceylon's well-forested hills, and then planting the cash crop that would enrich imperial commerce, the traders, and their market. Then suddenly, in the middle of this economic upsurge and runaway profits, a disease, the so-called coffee rust, blighted the entire enterprise, bringing hundreds of intrepid planters and their principals to bankruptcy and the occasional suicide. Hands were wrung in despair and thousands of acres were set aflame to still the biological storm. But in the end, the coffee boom was as good as dead. In 1867, one Scotsman, James Taylor by name, still had some resolve and stamina that would enable him to tide over this burden of misfortune. Within the Candy District, in the temperate elevation of this locale known as Galaha, and in the premises of his devastated coffee plantation, the rarefied air and the cool, salubrious environs of Lula Kondara estate prompted Taylor to experiment with another type of plant to see what he could see and do. Thus began the story of Ceylon tea. Having procured some tea plants from the Peradeniya Botanical Gardens, which had originated from the hill country of India, Taylor tried to grow these in Lula Kundara. They throve just as they had in Assam. But the challenge lay not in planting or growing, 
but in discovering a way that would make it possible for the harvest to leaf crop to retain its freshness and flavor over the time required to allow consumers in faraway Britain to enjoy their cup. The Chinese tradition was to harvest the leaf and process it immediately before serving. But for British consumers, it would need to be kept for a longer while and prevented from spoilage and staleness. In this context, the ingenuity and courage of James Taylor is the more remarkable. By sheer dint of good fortune and determination, a solution was arrived at and Taylor became the true pioneer of Ceylon tea, setting the bedrock for millions to be made by subsequent generations of planters, traders, marketers and packers, be they British or Sri Lankan. Brands were built and fortunes were secured and the stock market flourished even as it has until this present day by virtue of the strange and handsome events of the 19th century. And above all, Ceylon was placed prominently on the world map. As it turned out, Ceylon tea became the most renowned and versatile in terms of nature, nurture, as well as for a distinctive product from varied elevations where tea is cultivated in this veritable tropical paradise. Salon Tea set the benchmark. It still does. Salon Tea has brought together a whole range of sensations and sensitivities over many years and decades of an established orthodox practice that is really an art of tea. Nowhere on earth can there be found this fortunate blend of geographical and weather-related factors. These factors influence and enhance the active ingredients in the plant. This is why there is this outstanding variety in tea from a single source. There are seven growing regions that encompass large segments of land areas of Sri Lanka at different elevations, ranging from sea level to plantations 6,000 feet above sea level. At the highest elevation, typically in the wonderfully cool climes in Norelia, there is a tea that appears golden orange in the cup. The infusion is light and mellow and rather delicate in flavor. It is no surprise that connoisseurs acquainted with flavor and bouquet in a beverage refer to the Norelia tea as the champagne among teas. For certain, there is no alcoholic content in tea whatsoever. But as far as descriptive terminology goes, there is a rationale for considering this high-grown tea as possessing the finest in flavor and aroma with just a hint of spiciness alongside notes of peach and citrus. Such tea is best savored without adding sugar or milk in your cup. It is the extreme cool temperature in the nighttime at this elevation that persuades and teases the flavonoids or polyphenols in the tender tea leaf buds to yield those subtle flavors and aromas. In the coolest times of the year such as in the period December to February, these factors are emphasized ever more. The next level of high-grown tea is located at elevations ranging from 4,000 to 5,000 feet above sea level. The infusion that results from this high-grown tea variety has been compared favorably with Pinot Noir, a tea that is delicate, radiant and elegant and appearing medium brown with tints of orange. There is almost a savory taste that it yields and often fruity with an exotic perfume in the best harvest season. It is a strong tea, but not dark and brooding, but has ample tannins that give a fine balance in taste. Brewed lightly 
It may be enjoyed with no addition of milk or sugar, but with a full cup brewed to perfection, a dash of milk and with a spoon or two of bees honey does wonders to exalt the mood. At 2,000 to 3,000 feet, the flavor of the tea from these estates is strong, rich and full-bodied in the style of a Shiraz. This brew has the tendency to wake one up with an extra dimension of complexity, leading to a fine, energized feeling in the mouth. It satisfies and helps to counteract the sensation from having enjoyed a fuller than comfortable breakfast. Some would enjoy this with the addition of a little milk and sugar to sweeten the cup. But connoisseurs would still stick with the plain flavor of this mid-grown tea. It is a distinctive flavor with its own aroma. And the different estates at these elevations sometimes have their specific taste that results in the tea bush from a combination of the monsoon winds in season and natural soil content of these fabulous slopes. Finally, the low-grown teas. These are from estates located at elevations ranging from 1,000 feet above down to sea level, some of which are in the more southerly sections of Sri Lanka's map. The expressiveness of a good Cabernet Sauvignon can be experienced in this dark brown tea. Round, full, almost muscular and juicy, with elements of ever so slight sweet spices and bay leaf, which depends on the locale of the estate and the surrounding terrain. Those that love their tea as a restorative and taken sweet with sugar or cane or bees honey usually favor the low-grown salon tea. Some consumers even add some spices such as cardamom or cumin and sometimes a whiff of cinnamon or nutmeg when enjoying this type of dark brown tea. Milk is usually added to balance the flavor. Tea is a completely natural drink. It lends itself admirably to savoring the moment. Tea has been positioned among discerning users of safe beverages in the present day as the finest option they have for easy and quick refreshment. The British tea industry recognized and built on these factors at the outset. Tea, they knew, was not a generic and never a colored liquid that was consumed hurriedly of the force of habit. Rather, they fully understood the treasure lies in the flavor of the distinctive product from the many, many estates in Ceylon. Thereby, they could market and label their tea as suited for breakfast, midday, the afternoon and evening. It had a great deal to do with the cultivation of the palate and an equal portion of philosophical musing. From all of this comes the orthodoxy of Ceylon tea, the very factor that is the backbone of the industry through all this century and a half since James Taylor's happy experiment made its mark. The orthodox tradition of manufacturing or processing black tea was arrived at with care, accompanied by a scientific approach. Never was the cultivation or nurture of the tea bush a random matter or ever left to chance happenstance. Every action was born of will and strict planning at every stage of the production process. The tea bush flourishes where it is planted and can reach great heights but for the sake of the industry and for the convenience in harvesting the leaf, the manageable height is uniformly maintained at no more than at the waist or chest of the one that plucks. What is plucked is just two leaves beside the emergent bud, the most tender shoots that appear above the surface of the pruned bush. Any other leaf or one more mature on the plant is unsuited for the generation of flavor in fine Ceylon tea. No wonder that the orthodoxy of Ceylon tea demands 
the nimble fingers pick every single leaf. No machine can replicate this precision and it has been found that women have the mastery in this prescribed method where men are not as efficient. Picking or plucking the two leaves and a bud has also to be done at the correct time of day. Science plays its part at this point too. The polyphenols, the active ingredients in assembling the flavor and the goodness, come to the surface of the tea leaf by dawn and not too much time must elapse in the day before the leaf is captured. Freshness can only be ensured if the plucked leaf is quickly dispatched to the next stage in the process, namely sorting and cleaning. Before the fresh leaf becomes lifeless and limp, the load is quickly spread on the troughs where withering takes place. This is an important segment in the sequence for it is necessary for the leaf to be rid of a fair percentage of its moisture or else it will spoil or even rot away. Once the moisture has thus been reduced, the still green leaf is subject to rolling. Where once this was done manually, in the present day rolling machines accomplish this process with ease and efficiency. Rolling is important. In this way, the cells of the leaf are bruised though not mangled. Thus the polyphenols are released into the bulk of the tea being processed. This paves the way for the next phase. Roll breaking, where the particulate size is reduced and separated. <laughs>